thank you, Father, for this wonderful word, which we just heard a lot about just a few minutes ago, this word grace. And somehow, it seems to me that I will never live long enough to ever comprehend fully what this word means. The reason I won't is because it's a word that describes yourself. And I'll never live long enough to fully define who you are and what you are and what you are to me. Grace, what a wonderful word. Amazing grace. But I'm here to thank you for that grace. Because if salvation were not by grace, and if our relationship to you were not based surely and purely and totally upon grace, then none of us would ever know you. None of us would ever walk with you. None of us would ever hear from you. We thank you, Father, that those who are in the flesh cannot please God and that those who are in Christ cannot displease him because we're in this blessed and wonderful Son. Take away the trembling, shy, worried heart that most of us have in regards to grace and enable us to fully trust you and step out into the arms of grace and know that they will never fail. Now we came here this morning, Father, for one purpose, and that's to talk about Jesus. Man's not going to talk about him. We trust that the Holy Spirit will talk about him. What a wonderful person to talk about. Oh, Father, let us give more of ourselves to talking about Jesus. There's nothing that can be said about him except good. So what a wonderful subject of our conversation. We're here to hear from the Holy Spirit, his testimony about Jesus. Open our hearts so we might see him and hear him. Help us to comprehend what's given here this morning. We would ask the Holy Spirit especially to just take us at this point and lead us and guide us and direct us to Jesus. Destroy any prepared thoughts that we may have and give us those thoughts that we have unprepared, not prepared, but the thoughts that he has prepared for us. And help us to say not the words that we think are suitable, but help us to speak those words which he shall give us. And may it be done in the power and in the demonstration of the Holy Spirit to your glory and praise. And we know if this is accomplished, we can lay the test rule upon it, and it will show that Jesus has been glorified. He has increased and man has decreased. God has been exalted and a spirit of worship and adoration has sprung up in our hearts for thee. Thank you for this promise that you'll do this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm in kind of a mess this morning because the message that I wanted to preach all week long and the message I thought I was going to preach all week long, apparently I'm not going to get to give. However, I'm not sure it may come out this morning anyway. I want to preach on an entirely different subject and I was determined to do it up until early this morning and the Lord pressed another place on my heart in the Word. So I'd like to read in 2 Timothy chapter 4, and the words that I'm going to read are Paul's, at least his last recorded words, 2 Timothy chapter 4. In verse 6, he's giving a testimony, and this testimony he sends back to Timothy, who was his beloved son in the faith. For I'm now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. 
And I'd like to read correctly, I have fought the good fight, not speaking of the quality of his fighting, but speaking of the preciousness of the fight that he'd been engaged in. I have fought the good fight, I have finished my course, and I have kept the faith. And henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. And this is just a point of departure, because we're going to go to Hebrews 9 in just a moment for the message. I'd like to say this about the Apostle Paul. He was at the end of a long and turbulent ministry, and he surely had been engaged in a great fight. And it didn't seem to me at the beginning of the ministry that uh, preaching the gospel would be much of a fight. But it is a fight. And we wrestle daily with principalities and powers. As I've so often told you, all of the forces of Satan, all of the evil power, whatever that is, in this world, is set against the preaching of the gospel, the proclaiming of the grace of God, the telling forth of the good news, the simple relating of that good news which was first learned by Paul, that mystery which was unfolded to him by the Lord Jesus and given to him to announce to us poor Gentiles. And he fought this fight for more than 30 years. And it wasn't easy. And he's not speaking here of the quality of his fighting because he had already told the Corinthians that he himself couldn't judge how well he had done. He said, I'll have to leave that for the Lord to decide. He will judge all things when the time comes, and he will know whether I've been a faithful steward or not. That is, faithful in managing the dispensation of the grace of God which was committed to me. So he's not speaking of uh, how well he had fought the fight, but he was speaking of what a great fight he'd been in. Not great in its largeness, though it was a large fight, but great, precious, I think he counted it a privilege, a holy privilege to have been engaged in such a battle. He said, I've fought the good fight. I've fought the best fight there is. If a man has to fight, here's something worth fighting for, and here's something worth giving yourself for, and I've fought this good fight. And I have finished my course. He had finished his course. He had come to the end of the line. And I've kept the faith. That didn't mean he held out faithful to the end. But the same faith that was delivered to him by the Lord Jesus in the beginning was present in him at that moment. And he never deviated and he'd never varied from the faith that had been revealed to him. And so he says, henceforth, as a result, this is what I'm looking forward to now. There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord... That's Jesus. The righteous judge shall give me at that day, but not to me only, but unto all them also which love his appearing. And I find myself in this testimony of Paul in the little word all because he makes a statement about all of us. He was about to depart. The Greek says he was about to take down his tent. The march was over. And he was about to take down his tent, the battle was over, and march away home. The Greek says he was about to hoist his anchor and sail away. He was about to be set free. He was about to go home. And he was rejoicing. He was praising the Lord for the privilege of having been in a good fight. He was praising the Lord also that the end of the course had come. I look forward to the end of the course. I never get tired of the battle. I get tired in the battle sometimes, but I never get tired of the battle. And he was glad that the end of the line had come and the last battle had been fought and his captain was about to call him home, not simply on leave, but home forever. He'd be through with the battlefield forever and this good soldier of the Lord Jesus would be at rest. But he included me in these statements 
in that he looked forward to that day when he would see the righteous judge, the Lord. And the Lord had something for him, something that had been laid up for him for a long time. And I want to impress upon you, it was not something that he had earned. It was not something that was being given in reward for his faithfulness in the course that he had just finished and in the battle that he had just fought. But it was something that was a natural result of what he had known in his heart for a long time and what was true in Paul's heart was simply this. He loved the appearing of the Lord Jesus. He said, Unto all those who also love his appearing, that same crown of righteousness has been laid up. Now, righteousness is imputed. It's a free gift. This crown of righteousness is no reward for faithful service. This crown of righteousness that is already laid up where thieves can't break into steel, where rust can't corrupt, where nothing can happen to it, this inheritance that's laid up for the saints is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And he belongs to all those who love his appearing. And what I would like to say to you, that loving his appearing is the evidence, the proof, the fruit of possessing the righteousness that Christ is. Nobody can have this righteousness from God by faith without loving the appearing of the Lord Jesus. They love his appearance. They love the appearing of the Lord. Now, this is bigger than it seems on the surface because we always apply this to the rapture. And so we say this is a test. Uh, only the saved people look forward to the coming of the Lord. Only saved people love the appearing of the Lord in the air to catch his bride away. Which is a true statement of fact. But I don't think that Paul had this in mind because he wrote much during his earthly day about the appearance of the Lord Jesus. It didn't have anything to do with the rapture. And that's what I'd like to talk to you about first in uh, Hebrews chapter 9. And I'd like to read at verse 23 where Paul writes something about the appearance of the Lord Jesus. And I think it will shed some light on his dying statement that the crown of righteousness that was laid up for him was for loving his appearance. At verse 23, Paul writes in Hebrews 9, It was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these, and the these refers to the blood sacrifices of the Old Testament. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the ages hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, now to them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. You see what I'm getting to? There's other appearances besides the rapture. And only the man who has received righteousness by faith from the hand of God loves those appearances. Paul loved the appearance of the Lord Jesus. And this is elementary and basic, but I'll say it anyway. I was reading a paper yesterday, a little two-page two thing that had been mimeographed by somebody out there in religious land and mailed to me, and it was how to be a successful soul winner. And uh, they had two pages of rules and regulations and formulas, and the last statement on the page was, do this and souls will be born into the kingdom of God. And uh, as I read over that paper, I was dumbfounded 
the, the mechanical things that had been put there on the paper for man to do in order to get another man to do what God plainly states in the Word uh, none of us can do. Paul loved the appearance of the Lord Jesus, and I love the appearance of the Lord Jesus. And as I read over that paper, one of the things that was on that soul-winning guide was this, that how to tell if you've been successful and won your soul for Jesus. And under the heading, how to tell if you've had success, is number one, they will love the church. They will love the Bible. And so what I want to tell you, even though it's basic, a believer isn't known as a believer because he loves the Bible, nor because he loves the church. I'm talking about now the earthly church, the institutional church. Nor because he loves the Lord's work, nor because he loves the things that he does for Jesus, not even because he loves the brethren. He himself may know that he has passed from death unto life in that he loves the brethren in his heart and he can't fight this love. But others don't know this because this love oftentimes is conjured up and faked. But I'll tell you this, you can tell a believer and you can tell a man who has imputed righteousness because above all that he loves, he loves the appearing of the Lord Jesus. It's not the events of his appearances that he loves, it's him that he loves. He loves what he sees in him. He loves what he has heard of him. He loves what he knows of him. And Paul didn't simply love the appearing of the Lord Jesus in the rapture, and for that was rewarded with a crown of righteousness. He loved the first appearance of the Lord Jesus. And he loved the second appearance of the Lord Jesus. And then why wouldn't he love the next appearance of the Lord Jesus in order? And he loves every appearance Jesus will ever make to him, beginning at the first appearance and on through to the very last. And Jesus will be appearing to us in the sense that he will be manifesting himself to us for every day of the eternity to come. And that's what I love is more and more manifestation of the Lord Jesus. Now, in this passage in Hebrews 9, and I wrote a key word on my study notes this morning, it's the little word kiss, K-I-S-S, which means keep it simple, stupid. And I wrote that on my study notes this morning because if it isn't simple, us stupid people will not hear it. The Holy Spirit wants to make it simple. I'd like to talk to you about the first appearance of the Lord Jesus. Not his coming appearance, but one that has already taken place in the past. Paul speaks of it here in Hebrews 9, that once in the end of the ages he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So the first appearance of the Lord Jesus has already taken place. It's in the past. It's in history. I'd like to emphasize the little word once because Paul says once in the end of the ages he hath appeared. He hath, past tense. He will never appear again like this. That is, he will never appear again to do what he did in his first appearance. As the faithful servant of Abraham was instructed never to bring his son again into the land, so God will never send his Son into the land again for a repeat performance of what he has already done. No one will ever bring him to earth again to die. No one will ever put him in that place of humiliation again. Once he came, once he appeared, once he did what he came and appeared for, and he will never, never, never do it again and there's a warning in that. Don't miss his first appearance. Because if you don't love his first appearance, you'll never love his next appearance. So we have to talk about this first appearance. It took place in the end of the ages. 
The word age simply refers to a period of time marked off by a beginning and an end, a dispensation. And the Bible teaches us that the Lord Jesus laid out time as we know it into various ages. He marked them off into different portions with a beginning and with an end and during which time he would make some special revelation. But all of the ages that he created, all of the ages that he laid out, and all of the ages that he planned, every dispensation of time, as far as man is concerned, was fulfilled and culminated in this first appearance of the Lord Jesus when he appeared to put away sin by the offering of himself. The meaning of every age is found not in his birth, at Bethlehem, not in his ministry, not in his life, but in his sacrifice of himself when he put away sins. The word appear means to show forth oneself, to fully reveal oneself, to fully manifest oneself. And I emphasize that this appearance that took place once in the end of the ages was not his appearance at Bethlehem. It was not his appearance in his earthly ministry, though he showed forth flashes of who he was and what he was. He was never fully revealed until he died on Calvary's cross. Flashes of his glory shone through in all that he did and said. He came and he tabernacled among us, which means the true glory that he was was hidden under the unsightly tabernacle that he wore. And even though he performed miracles indicating his power, and even though he spoke words like no man had ever spoken before and indicated his wisdom, and even though he demonstrated love and compassion and mercy and kindness, who he was and what he was was never fully shown forth until the end of all the ages came. And the end of all the ages came at the cross at Golgotha when the Son of God died to put away sin by the offering of himself. That's when the ages came to an end. That's when he fully appeared. Now, many people didn't understand what they saw there. In fact, no one did. But he sent a man whose name was Paul. And Paul's ministry was unique in this way. He was the first man to fully declare what was revealed there at the cross of Calvary. He was the first man to tell the mystery of it all. He was the first man to share with any other human the real meaning of Jesus' appearance on this earth and the culmination of the ages. And the real meaning was this. He came to die, not to live. He came to give himself a sacrifice. He came not to be ministered to, but to minister. Not to us, but to God in the holy sanctuary. This man came, and it was not fully made known what he was and what he did, until Paul announced that good news, and it was this. He put away sin. He removed it. He separated it. He took it away. And he did it by the offering of himself. Now, this is important to me. It may not be to you, but it is to me. Because I'll tell you, this is where the battle turns, right here on this point. He either did what he came to do or he didn't. He accomplished what he was sent to do or he didn't accomplish it. 
And if he didn't accomplish it, he will have to come back. But, oh, I'm comforted by this word once. Once was enough for this man once in one sacrifice did that which needed to be done and that which had to be done and that which God willed to be done and that which the eternal counsel of God had decreed should be done. He came and in this appearance at the cross of Calvary he put away sin by the offering of himself. How did he do it? By bearing the sins of men. That's what Paul says. Bearing the sins of men. How many had their sins borne by the Lord Jesus? All. A-L-L. All men of all time. Everywhere. Had their sins borne by the Lord Jesus. When he offered himself to put away those sins. Peter said, Who in his own body on the tree bear our sins? First thing I did this morning when I get up was read the 19th chapter of John, the 23rd chapter of Luke. I just wanted to go back at the cross and stand there a little bit before the day got started. And as I read the story of how they took him away and they crowned him with thorns and scourged him and led him to Golgotha, as I read again how they nailed him there on the two pieces of wood and lifted him up, I thought of his sufferings. I thought of the torn hands and the damaged tendons and the frayed nerves and the quivering flesh and I thought of the stripes on his back and I thought of the pierced brow. And I thought of how he'd been beaten black and blue until he didn't resemble a human being. As I stood there at the cross and looked at him one more time and thought about him one more time, the silence was broken by his words. Because as far as the Bible record is concerned, we have not a word out of Jesus. Not a word. He was dumb in his judgment and taken away, wasn't he? In that silence. He opened not his mouth, the scripture says. He made not a word of defense. Not a word of plea. Not a word asking for pity. Not a word of communication with God or man. From the time they lay hold of him in the garden and take him before the magistrates and all of that, not a word is open, is given in his own defense. When he's pressed for answers, he says things like, Thou hast said. And I think from the time they let him out of the judgment hall, bearing his cross, there is nothing but this awesome silence. Scary. It's weird. Surely he's going to say something, but he doesn't. Surely he will speak up, but he doesn't. He had already said he could call twelve legions of angels. Surely he'll do this now. But he's taken to the cross, and even while they nail his hands and his feet down fast to the cross, and even while now they pick it up and thump it down in the rock socket of the earth until every, every bone is dislocated, until his whole body is wrenched out of joint, until the blood and the sweat and the tears stream down over his face and his body and cover his nakedness. Not a word. Not a word. And now he hangs there between heaven and earth and men watch him die. As I stood there this morning, I, it seemed to me that in my mind's eye I could see his lips begin to tremble. And now his mouth is open and he's going to speak. And a hush falls. And he utters his first words. And the first word is Father. What will follow? <laughs> will he say, Father, help me? Father, save me? 
Father, deliver me. Oh, he'd already settled this before he went to Calvary. What shall I say then? Father, save me. He'd already decided what he would say at the cross. And it could never be, Father, save me. It was for this hour that I came into the world. That's what my appearance is all about. And I cannot fully show who I am and who God is until that moment when I bear the sins of many and give myself a sacrifice for these ones who have sinned. And so when he opens his mouth to speak, the first words that fell from the Savior's mouth, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Oh, these are astounding words, 17 little words. But in the uttering of that prayer, he exhibited himself fully. He showed himself fully. And the purpose for which he appeared. Oh, I, I get so much out of that prayer. I'd like to preach on it sometime again. First of all, it's the proof positive that he was God's sinless and spotless lamb. Just moments from eternity. Standing on the very threshold of certain death knowing that within a few moments he would be plunged into the outer darkness of eternity and separated from God in that awful place. Just moments before he died, this sinless, spotless lamb without guile and without blemish, who was the friend of sinners and who was tempted in all points like we are tempted, and yet apart from sin, he had no sins of his own to confess. He had no forgiveness to beg. He had not a single regret to express to his father. He could look full into the face of the holy God, call him father, and never mention a word that he ever said, a deed that he ever done, or a thought that he ever had, or an emotion that welled up within his breast that should not have been there. This pure, pure, holy, sinless lamb could look into the face of God and say, I have no sins to confess. I have no forgiveness to obtain. I have no righteousness to establish. Father, and because he was that sinless and spotless lamb without blemish, he could pray the prayer that he prayed, and it went like this, forgive them. There's nothing to forgive me for. The forgiveness I asked for is for them. Well, <clears throat> I'm not just emphasizing the bigness of Jesus' heart or the kindness of Jesus in asking God a favor on our behalf. What I'd like to emphasize to you is the awful depth of that prayer. Jesus was the only one who ever walked on the earth who understood fully what it meant to have sins forgiven. That is, he knew what was involved with God like no other man could ever have known. You see, we have a human kind of forgiveness that is not godlike. When someone says to me, forgive me, what they're really asking me to do is uh, set aside the vengeance or the retaliation that I felt for the thing they did against me. They're asking me to forego the penalty. They're asking me to not uh, take revenge upon them. They're asking me not to hold it against them. They're asking me to just forget that the thing happened. And so they're by not harboring any grudge or ill feelings or pursuing for any thought of vengeance. That's human forgiveness. 
And when we say, I forgive you, that's what we mean by that. I will not hold it against you. I will not retaliate because of what you've done against me. But God never, never, never forgives like that. God can't forgive like that because to forgive like that means that he will have to set aside his own standards, his own righteousness, his own holiness, the sacredness of his own word, the integrity of his own person. When God forgives, he can only forgive when the vengeance has been worked upon the guilty party. God can only forgive when the curse has been borne by the cursed one. God can only forgive when the wages of the sin has been connect, uh, collected. God can only forgive. God can only send it away by destroying it in his vengeance and in his wrath. For sin is against a holy God, and sin has to be dealt with. It wasn't anything God could do like a mathematical miracle. By just balancing the ledger, by writing it off as a bad debt, God didn't do that. God said to the soul that sinneth it must die, and the man who owes God and hath ought to pay, as the parable says, shall be delivered to the hand of the tormentors. And the last stripe shall be laid upon his back, and the last farthing shall be exacted from him. That's a fact. The forgiveness of sins isn't some easy thing. You know, I was raised in a religious world and I was taught that it was. Until the Holy Spirit broke through the darkness of my heart and revealed the truth of the good news that there is in Jesus. I believed until that time that the forgiveness of sins depended upon me being sorry. It depended upon my tears or dependent entirely upon my repentance, or upon my promises, or upon my performance. And my theology went like this. I believed this in my heart. I know I've sinned against God, and I know my sins are terrible, but any time that I show some remorse over these sins, any time I shed a tear or two, any time I get teary-eyed about it and say to God, I'm really sorry, God, that I sinned against you, God, being the kind and gracious and wonderful person that he is, will just wipe it all out with a wave of his hand and say, your tears are enough in payment. Your remorse is enough to cancel the debt. I'm moved by your concern and your repentance, and therefore I've changed my mind. I will not punish you, and I will not bring vengeance on you, and I hereby forgive you. No, that's what I believed, but that's a lie. God spared not his own son. When his own son bore the sins of many. God delivered him to the tormentors, just as he would deliver me or you. Not because he's a mean God, but because he's a God that is immutable in his word, and a God who cannot change, and a God who could not be anything less than what he is, holy and righteous. And the righteousness and the holiness of God demand the death of those who sin against him. No, God doesn't forgive like I said a minute ago. Here's the way he forgives. He forgives by exacting the, that penalty, by carrying out and executing that sentence. God forgives by cursing those who have broken his law. God forgives by making the sinner collect the wages of his sin. And Jesus knew this full well. He's the only person on earth who really understood forgiveness from God's viewpoint. So he didn't just say something idle when he said, Father, forgive them. He wasn't intervening, mediating. Oh, no, he wasn't doing that. 
He was not acting as a priest when he said, Father, forgive them. He was not acting as a mediator when he said, Father, forgive them. This was something between himself and his father. And he was asking his father in his private chambers to accept him as a suitable offering in the stead of those who should perish. He was asking his father this, Take me. When I say, Father, forgive them, I'm asking you to charge their sins to me. I'm asking you to make me the sin that I am. I'm asking you to grant me the place they now occupy. And when I say, Father, forgive them, I'm asking you to exact from me the last farthing. Lay upon me the last strike. Sentence me to the outer darkness and banish me from your presence. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Ah, the sacrifice of himself was more than just the poverty that he lived in. It was more than just the friendless state in which he existed. It was more than just the hostility of the world against him and the persecution of his enemies. It was more than just the hardships of the way. It was more than just what he gave up in the glory. It was more than just bearing the likeness of man. The sacrifice of himself. The showing forth of himself. The full appearance of God in the flesh took place here at the cross of Calvary when he offered of himself in death to God in the place of the sinners and bore in his own body on that tree the sins that were mine the sins that are mine and all the sins that shall be mine from the cradle to the grave, when he asked his father, put them all in me, make me to be that man that you might be free to forgive them on a righteous ground, justify them and yet remain just. This is what he begged the father for on the cross of Calvary. And this, my dear people, was his first appearance. And I love that appearance. I love his appearance. I love it. I like his words and I like his miracles. I like his life. But I love his appearing at the cross of Calvary. For had he not appeared that way to me, I would find no comfort in his words and no hope in his miracles. For two thousand long years have gone by and he is not present with me. But because he appeared at the cross, God hath appeared to me. And when God appeared to me, here's how he appeared. God is love. God loves me. And I love that appearance. Oh, I like his appearance on Mount Sinai <laughs> with the thunder and the fire and the smoke and the heavy words. And I liked his appearance all throughout the Old Testament, but not until he showed forth himself fully and showed all that he was and appeared in the full manifestation of who he is. That's when I loved his appearance. And that appearance took place at the cross of Calvary. They say that was his last appearance. No, no. There was an appearance following that Paul speaks of here. For he says, Now Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. And I'd like to explain a little bit about this appearance. And oh, I'd truly love this one. 
What I've just told you about at the cross is half the gospel message. Just half. Forgiveness means to send off, to separate, to take away, to remove. And this appearance at the cross removed my sins from me, took them away, separated them from me. You know that? The sins he bare for me in his own body on the tree. When he prayed, Father, forgive Herb, he knows not what he does. You say, did God answer him? In the 11th of John, Jesus made a statement that God always heard him, and God always answered him. And when he asked this for me, God heard him, and God put upon him my sins and my iniquities and my transgressions that he might freely separate and remove and take away my sins from me so that when I die, and thank God, as I live, I do not live in my sins, nor do I die in my sins. They've been removed from me, separated and taken away by the offering of himself to God. That's half the gospel. Here's the other half. At his resurrection, he entered into heaven itself, defined further here as the presence of God. And he entered into the heaven itself, into the presence of God for me. To appear there, and this word appear means to exhibit in person, he appeared at the cross of Calvary in my behalf and showed forth himself what he was. But when he appeared in the presence of God, hear me carefully, in heaven itself, he appeared to manifest before the very presence of God what he had made me. By his death, burial, and his resurrection, he made me a son glorified. He made me a son received. He had obtained for me an eternal redemption. He had purified not only earth, not only my heart. He purified also the heavenlies themselves and separated sin from the presence of God, as well as separating sin from me. He opened heaven up, walked into the presence of God, and stood face to face with the holy God, and God looked into him with a scrutinizing gaze and was pleased with what he saw. I don't know whether the import of that gets hold of you or not, but when Jesus came to earth, before he came, I'll just tell you briefly, before he came, he was God. That doesn't mean he was any less God while he was here, but I'm impressing upon you that before he came, he was in the beginning, and he was the eternal God. And God is a spirit, and no man has ever seen God at any time. But this eternal God entered into the human race and took upon himself the outward form of a human being. And this eternal God, who had never been seen by man, tabernacled, lived among us, walked around among us like a human being, and appeared like a man. Let me tell you that this, this God took upon himself the likeness of sinful flesh without the nature of Adam and lived for 33 years this way, so that identifying himself with man, the God that he was could fully show himself at the cross of Calvary by taking the creature's place and the Creator dying in his stead. He had to take a part of the human nature, that is, the human likeness, in order that he might be put in the place of death. God could not be exposed to the hazard of death any other way. 
God could not be subject to the power of death any other way. And so he came and took upon himself human bones and flesh. Though the blood which he carried in that holy thing prepared in the womb of Mary was the eternal everlasting blood of God. The life that animated that human body that walked around the streets of Jerusalem and strolled on the coasts of Galilee. That human body was animated by the eternal life principle, God himself. And when at the cross of Calvary, in his first and last request to God in our behalf, when he prayed, Father, forgive them, they know not what to do, he was saying, make this man to be an offering unto you acceptable and a sacrifice unto them acceptable. Let me take their sins. Let me be made their sin. And, and in order to, to make this theologically clear to you, let me imagine a little conversation between Jesus and his Father at that time. Father, forgive them. Son, do you know what you're asking? Yes, Father. I can only forgive them, Son, if you perish. I know that, Father. But, Son, have you thought of this? That if you take their sins in your own body... And if I impute their sin to you at your death, do you know that if these sins and that sin passes upon your soul at death, you know that I will forsake you. You know that you can no more come into my presence than any other human being can. Because once you take the sinner's place, I'll send you to hell as sure as you're hanging on that cross. And if you think I'm going to spare you, you better think deeply on this before you finish your prayer. I'll spare you not, but I'll deliver you up and the last stripe will fall upon your back. And if you insist on this, I will wound you for their transgressions. I will bruise you for their iniquities. And I will chastise you for their peace. Every wave of my judgment will pass over you. Every stripe of my wrath will fall upon you. Every curse of my law will sheathe itself in you. And think about this, son. You leave life like that. And at the moment you die, the legions of angels you depended upon will no longer be at your beck and call. You will speak, but you can't open the grave, nor force the gates of hell. For when you die, you're cut off from me. You with me? Father... Forgive them. And I'll die in this faith that you will not leave my soul in hell nor suffer me to see corruption. Because after all, Father, what I'm doing, I'm doing not primarily for them. I'm doing for you. I come to do thy will Oh, God, let it be done. And he died like that. And do you know that when he was raised from the dead, he was no longer like he was before he came to Bethlehem? I don't know how else to say it except to tell you that he was stuck with the likeness of us poor human beings forever. He's not some vapor, some spirit up there in heaven, 
The Bible says that the Son of Man is sitting there, glorified in a resurrected and glorified body that bear yet the wounds which he received in the offering of himself. And when this glorified Son of Man was raised, not by his own might, but by the power of God, who could not suffer this Holy One to be corrupt, and by this Holy God, who would not leave his soul in hell, and so promised David years before. When God raised him from among the dead ones, Jesus didn't stop on the earth and walk around and say, Well, I made it this far. I don't want to push my luck. He ascended right into the heavenlies, walked right into the very presence of God. This man, who just a few hours before had been made sin personified, this man who in just a few hours before lost his manhood, lost his eternal life, and became a worm even in his own eyes, this man, who bare the sins of many and was banished to hell, not being spared by his father, this man, once so defiled in the death of the cross, dares now to walk into the heavenlies, into the very presence of God, and seek to be seated, not at the feet of God, I tell you, in the right hand of his throne, equal with God. And when he appeared, he exhibited himself in person. And this is in contrast with the Old Testament priest, who upon entering the Holy of Holies carried the incense censer, waving it furiously, frantically, that the whole place might be filled with smoke. Remember reading that? Why? Well, to shield him from the full look at God's glory. And another reason, to shield from God a full look at the unworthiness of this man. But when Jesus entered into the heavenlies and into the very presence of God, he carried no incense censer, and he filled not the holy place with smoke. He fully exhibited his person to the scrutinizing, searching, analytical gaze of a holy God. And God revealed himself to this glorified man in all the glory which he shared before the foundation of the world. And when God looked at him, this is what he said. Thou art my son, and this day have I begotten thee. Sit here, sit here at my right hand. I'll make all your enemies to be your footstool. But don't miss this point. When he received this firstborn to glory, he received the firstborn among many brethren. Many sons which would be brought to glory. When God received him, he received us all. When God accepted him, he accepted us all. And how did he come? How did he gain entrance? Why didn't the holy creatures who stand guard over God's throne destroy him when he entered into the heavenlies and into the presence of God? I'll tell you why. Because he entered with his own unique and precious blood. He brought no animal sacrifices. He brought no human works of righteousness. He brought no morality, no goodness, no kindness, no human characteristics. He entered the holiest of all with the unique blood which he shed at the cross of Calvary. And he brought it to the mercy seat and laid it there with boldness, boldness that his father could not deny himself, but would find his eternal satisfaction in that offering which he made. And oh, when he did this, he did it for us. What do you mean he did it for us? He did it in this way. He acted for all of us. 
Just as Adam acted for all of us in the Garden of Eden, Jesus acted for all of us at the cross of Calvary. He acted for all of us in his descent into the deep, and he acted for all of us in his entrance into the heavenlies. One place in the book of Hebrews he's referred to as a scout. He's called the forerunner. The forerunner. And Paul says this forerunner has already entered in within the veil. A scout goes ahead to see what dangers are out there. A scout goes ahead to mark the trail. A scout goes ahead to bring back the good news that's safe ahead. A scout rides out in a hostile land, in enemy territory, and plots the course and comes back and says, follow me, and I'll get you safely through. Jesus was my scout. He was my forerunner. He dared to go right into the very presence of God at judgment when he died and face the full fury of what lay ahead for me. He was my forerunner in that he descended into the deep and tasted the dregs of hell and suffered the torments of outer darkness and the damned in my behalf. And he made his way into the heavenlies, into the very presence of God. And God received him. God accepted him. God claimed him with peace. And he sends back the good news from where he is. The way is clear. Come boldly. You don't need to be afraid. <laughs> all the lions are chained. And all the dangers are past. <laughs> oh, you're not headed into the hands of an angry God. You're headed into the arms of a loving Father. God is at rest. God is at peace. You've been reconciled to him by my blood and by my sacrifice. And as he has seated me and glorified me, so has he also seated you and glorified you. Come boldly. Come with the full assurance of faith. Listen carefully. At the cross of Calvary, I declared God's righteousness in the sins that are past. But when I entered the heavenlies into the very presence of God, I declared your righteousness for all eternity. This priest, this glorified son, this one who sees both sides, this one who is touched by the feelings that come because of my weakness, this firstborn among many brethren, this scout is also said to be my anchor, holding now within the veil. That's why I'm so sure of heaven, and that's what my righteousness is all about. I was telling brother the other night on the way to Charleston for the meeting. So there's some hymns that I used to sing years ago that most of them sail over my head 30 feet. But every now and then we'd sing one and it got hold of my heart in a strange way. It seemed like when I'd sing those simple words that it was me saying to God what I believed and what I knew to be so. And I commented on one of those hymns. And the chorus goes like this. This is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. No other found. I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It seemed like every time we sung that, I wanted to, I wanted to emphasize that one part. This is this is all my righteousness 
All the righteousness I have, it's Christ. My righteousness does not depend upon His righteous offering plus my righteous works. All my claim before God. All my hope with God. All my destiny rests on this one thing, Christ alone. Entered into heaven, received, accepted, glorified, and seated there as the canceled receipt for everything that stood between myself and God. This righteousness who is a person, that's my only claim to God. And that's my only assurance of heaven. And that's my only hope of eternal life. And how sure is that hope? It's as sure as the heavenlies and the presence of God itself. Because if He is there, I am there. Now I feel like asking you a dumb question like, do you believe that? I want you to. Because as the brother said this morning, it will bring you into a state of rest. A rest from your own labors. And a glorious fellowship of rest with God in His work, which He's already finished. Now there's more to this appearance, and then I close with this. He hath already appeared in the past. And he is now appearing in the present for me. And oh, I want to say this. I love his first appearance at the cross. But I love his appearance in the presence of God too. There's times, and let me say, I'm, I, I had to hesitate because I don't want to say the thing in the wrong way. There's times when the thoughts of the cross and in His appearance for me there, somehow they don't comfort me. And somehow they don't do for me what needs to be done. Because it's only half the message. He died at the cross that my sins might be forgiven me. And that's wonderful. But sometimes I can't look back to the past and say, okay, God has forgiven me all my sins, but I'm living in the present. I'm living in the now. And the thing that the Holy Spirit does for me that gets me going again is to remind me that He didn't quit appearing for me at the cross. He's appearing for me now in the presence of God. And I don't get from that a picture in my mind that He's up there pleading with God, trying to appease a God that's angry with me and trying to hold Him back from destroying me or keep Him from punishing me. This is the idea that the church world always left with me was that God was up there wrestling with the Lord Jesus Christ. God wanting to come off His throne and destroy us poor sinners and Jesus up there pleading and begging and praying and appeasing. Do you ever have that picture? Oh, no. This is what the Holy Spirit shows me and this is what comforts my heart. There isn't any fight going on in heaven. There isn't any argument. There isn't any debate and there isn't any discussion. God has no reason to be appeased. God has no reason to work violence or vengeance upon any human being again. God retired from judgment in the day that Jesus entered the glory. Did you know that? Yes. I'll tell you what's going on in heaven. God and Jesus are satisfied with each other. Jesus is satisfied with the Father's presence forever and ever. And the Father is satisfied with the Son's presence forever and ever. Whatever there is upon this earth that ought to upset God, and whatever there is upon this earth that ought to anger God, and whatever there is upon this earth that ought to incite God to violence, and whatever there is on this earth that ought to wreak judgment from the throne of God, God is at rest about 
in that he exhausted his wrath, his judgment, when he put it all on Jesus. There isn't any of it left. He's satisfied with Jesus. What's God think about when he sees me? He thinks about Jesus. What does he feel when he feels towards me? He feels for me what he feels for Jesus. What does he hear when he listens to me? He hears his beloved son leading me in praise in my heart unto him. How does he see me? In my sins? No. In my Savior. Does he see me in the flesh? Oh no, those who are in Christ, God never sees in the flesh. That's an invention of the religious world. He sees them in Christ. Well, what's his reaction when he looks upon me? Love, peace, joy, long-suffering, meekness, kindness, temperance, <laughs> compassion. New every morning. He gets out of bed every morning. I suppose God goes to bed. It says he doesn't sleep. And that's, I was rejoicing last night that he and I had another thing in common. We neither want to sleep. <laughs> He neither slumbers nor sleeps. I suppose he goes to bed. I, the reason I go to bed is to rest. I don't think it's necessary to sleep to rest. So when I can't sleep, I just lay there and say, at least I'm resting. And that's important. But when God goes to bed at night and I go to bed at night, because there's nothing to worry about, and he gets up in the morning, regardless of what I think about him or regardless how I feel toward him in the morning, he never feels any differently towards me every morning of my life. And I'll tell you how he feels towards me every morning. Every morning, his compassion is fresh and new for me. How fresh and how new is this compassion? The same surge of compassion fills his heart for me every morning that filled it when he looked upon the Lord Jesus sitting at his right hand in this appearance at his resurrection and felt the full satisfaction of a glorified son at his right hand. That's what he feels towards me every morning of my life. And no matter how much I badmouth myself, and no matter how much you badmouth me, and no matter how much the devil accuses me, and no matter how much I run myself down or put myself down, God never hears and he never sees anything but the glorified Lord Jesus Christ when he thinks and hears from me. That's a fact. I'm going to die preaching that. Some of you don't like this gospel. I'm going to die preaching this gospel. Because that's good news. That's good news. He's going to make another appearance. Paul speaks of it here. Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Now they tell me that this doesn't have anything to do with me. This has to do with the Jews. They tell me this is the appearance of Messiah in the glory. And I, I grant this much of that, that when he is manifest to Israel, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. And it will be to the salvation of the nation. But since I am a Jew, and I don't intend to be on this earth when Christ returns in glory, there surely must be something here that has to do with me, because when he appeared to put away sin by the offering of himself, that had to do with me. And when he appeared in the presence of God for me, by his own precious blood, that had to do with me. And I feel somehow this has something to do with me when Paul says, Them that look for him shall he appear the second time apart from sin and the salvation. I want to impress upon you that the Lord Jesus is coming again. 
Paul says that there will be a moment of time, just as really as the moment, that strategic moment, when he came into the human race. There will be a moment in history, a moment in time, just as sure, just as certain, as in the last of the ages when he sent him to put away sin for the offering, by the offering of himself. He's sending him again. And he's coming for you, and he's coming for me. He's not far away, a trillion mil, a million miles away in space somewhere. He's now dwelling in us by the presence of the Holy Spirit. And in the moment, the twinkling of an eye, the door to the fourth dimension will open and the door to the third will close. And it's not that we will be transported someplace. It is that we will suddenly enter into the full realization that we are now where we have always been since before the foundation of the world, in the heavenlies, in the very presence of God himself. And in that day when he descends from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and the trump of God, and the bodies of those saints that are now sleeping are raised to the glory which is theirs and crowned with the righteousness which has already been imputed to them, you and I shall be caught up together to meet the Lord face to face. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Well, the Lord is ever with us now, but we are ever going to be with him then. And in this time, when this takes place, the only people who will see his appearing, the only people to whom he shall appear apart from sin unto salvation, are those who look for him and those who love his appearing. I want to make that very clear. Do you love his appearance at the cross? And do you love his appearance in the glory? Oh, then you love his appearance in the air. Did you look when this strange man named Jesus appeared on the earth, and did you look for the appearance of God's salvation for you and found it when you saw him dying in your place? And when he ascended, were you like the religious world? He just raised his hands in blessings, swallowed up by the clouds. There ain't nobody seen him since. Or is he just as much alive now as he was then in the presence of God and present in you. You love that appearance? Well, it goes without saying that you also love his appearance in the air. And you look for him. I used to be very, 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 very interested in the events of history and the events of prophecy, which is history foretold. I used to like to interpret what the newspapers say in the light of the prophecy so that everybody could tell where we are and where we're going and what's going on. But I have to confess that somewhere along the way I got swallowed up in something more interesting. His appearance. His appearance. Not the event, not the things that are going to take place on the earth. His appearance. After I see him, I don't mind telling you, after I see him, I don't care a whole lot of what happens. I want to see him. This word appear means to gaze with wide open eyes. And when it says he shall appear, he shall fill our gaze. Our wide open eyes shall be filled with him. That is, for those who look for him, the word look means to have an eager, yearning gaze. And every true believer I know who loves the appearance of the Lord Jesus at the cross, who loves his appearance in the presence of God for us, every true believer I know has an eager, yearning gaze. They're staring out into space. And the only thing that will ever fill their wide open eyes and satisfy that eager yearning gaze is the face of Jesus. That's all. Not the millennium, not the great temple was to be rebuilt in Jerusalem, 
Not the lion laying down with the lamb. Not the reign of peace, not Armageddon. Not the angels, not the awful catastrophic events that are going to take place upon the earth. The one thing that the believer's heart yearns for, eagerly, awaits, longs for, dreams about, desires, prays for, and lives for, is that moment when we see him as he really is, and we see ourselves, not as we shall be, but as he has already made us. Back in the Old Testament, the high priest made an official appearance on the great day of atonement, which occurred somewhere around the 10th of October every year. And when the great day of atonement came, he appeared three times, and that coincides with this passage of Scripture here. His first public appearance was at the Brazen Altar. And at the Brazen Altar, we stood just outside the tabernacle door when it was pitched in the wilderness. This great altar overlaid with brass, which sp spoke of judgment with his four horns, it was there at this brazen altar that the sin sacrifice was killed, that the offering was made for the sins of the people. And there the high priest took the sin goat, cut his throat, caught his blood in a basin, and disappeared. Because he took that blood-filled basin inside the great veil and back into the Holy of Holies. And there amid the smoke of the incense, he offered the blood of the sinless for the sinful, for the substitute for the sinner, there upon the mercy seat of God. And there in the Holy of Holies he appeared for the people. He appeared in their behalf, pleading the blood for mercy, pleading the blood for grace, pleading the blood for salvation. And there, after he had offered the blood in the Holy of Holies, he made his third appearance. He came out and the scapegoat felt the touch of the high priest's hands and he laid on him all the sins and the iniquities and the transgressions of the people and had him sent away into the wilderness never to return again without sin, apart from sin, and then he turned and faced the people in the gate of the court, and it was done. Jesus came, and he went to the brazen altar, and there was no ram caught in the thicket by his horns that day. He was that ram. He was both priest and sin offering, knife and fire. He was the brazen altar. He was the sacrifice and the sacrificer, the offering and the offerer. And there at the brazen altar of Calvary, he killed himself, for that's truly what he did. He shed his own blood and laid down his own blood, a ransom for many. And oh, my dear brethren, in his second appearance, he, like the high priest of old, carried his own blood into the Holy of Holies. And not now amidst the smoke of the incense did he offer this blood, but there openly face to face with God, he laid that precious offering upon a throne which had always been of judgment until that moment and turned it in to a throne of grace. And there will be a day when he will come out of hiding. That is a day when he will be manifest openly. A day when faith will become sight. A day when we no longer will go with the eyes of faith, seeing him at Calvary, seeing him in the presence of God by faith alone. There will be a day when we shall see him face to face. And in that day, the significant thing for me is that it will be apart from sin. I will never see any sin. 
again under the full salvation which he bought for me, even the redemption of my body and the glorification which he now says I have even this moment. Now I look forward to that. It's going to be an awful disappointment to a lot of people. And you just have to rationalize that as best you can. I think the people that it will be a disappointment to won't be there to be disappointed, but I like to say it anyway. There'll be an awful lot of disappointed religious people. Because they expect when Jesus comes that the next few years or eons or ages is going to be taken up in a big discussion about sin. There will never be a discussion about sin. So whatever your thoughts are about the judgment seat of Christ, if it has to do with sin and chastisement and punishment, forget it. I see the judgment seat of Christ as a time of joy, a time of blessing. A time when we enter into the fullness of what we are and what he made us. And the good works which he before ordained that we should walk in them and we do. A full display of ourselves as his workmanship, not ours. No discussion of sin and sins. When we see him in that day, it will be apart from sin. Under the full release, the full healing, the full making well of all of us here this morning. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. Lord bless you.